Back in 2010, class of 1950 alumnus Roger Mudd, an extraordinary and well-known journalist in America, gave the university a generous gift for a center that would look into important ethical issues. At the time, back in 2010, Roger Mudd said, given the state of ethics in our current culture, this seems a fitting time to endow a center for the study of ethics, and my university is its fitting home. That's what Roger Mudd said in 2010. It was true then, it's, it's definitely true now. The center plays an important part in the life of the school by choosing a topic every year, a broad topic of ethical importance. This year's topic is the ethics of technology. Not a day goes by without all of us reading in a newspaper or on the internet something about the technological revolution and about the many issues um, that that revolution has brought about. Such things as gene editing, altering human DNA, artificial intelligence and robotics in the workplace and elsewhere. Um, big tech firms like Facebook and Google and the other ones, their practices, their handling of private information, uh, issues relating to cybersecurity, in which in a number of noted situations people have hacked into seemingly secure institutions. So we pick that broad topic, the ethics of technology, and we began then to Put together a schedule of speakers from outside the university and from within some of our own talent and we've come up with a very exciting I think schedule for this year's ethics theme. Our keynote speaker is a bioethicist, lawyer and scholar and researcher into the whole area of gene editing, gene modification, altering of human DNA and her name is Josephine Johnston. She's the head research scholar at an entity called the Hastings Center in the state of New York. She has a new book coming out called Human Flourishing in the Age of Gene Editing. So she's bringing a philosophical, ethical perspective to some extremely important scientific developments. We've all read about the Chinese scientist who some months ago said that he had altered the DNA of two microscopic embryos that later developed into human persons and are now born. The question of what are the ethical limits of such practices? And Josephine Johnson is gonna lead us through the evolution of that question over time and then she's going to pick a specific application connected to gene editing. She's going to look at the good parent in our culture today. Does the good parent alter the genetic makeup of its children? Does the good parent look into all of this? Does the good parent do anything uh, to make use of sex technologies? How should we think about this? What ethical values should be part of the culture's consideration of this topic. We're very excited about that as the kickoff um, speaker for this year's series.
Got plenty of seats here, you guys. Second row here. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Roger Mudd Center for Ethics, I want to welcome you to the keynote lecture in this year's series on the ethics of technology. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I want to gratefully acknowledge that without the generosity of alumnus and journalist Roger Mudd, we wouldn't be here. It was Roger Mudd who saw an opportunity for a special place on this campus that would focus carefully on important issues and their ethical implications. Founding director Angie Smith put the center in place and developed a successful model. So Mr. Mudd, if you are watching on this streamed event, we send you our greetings, our warm wishes, and our thanks for your gift to the intellectual life of the school. Now each year the center selects, yeah. Each year the center selects a broad theme and invites guests from different disciplines and perspectives to address aspects of the theme. This year we chose the ethics of technology given the incredible scope of technological change in our society and societies around the globe. Lots of change, yes, but perhaps too little sense of ethical direction. So today we begin a conversation on what those changes actually are, where they may be leading us, what decisions may be needed, and what values will be crucial to the conversation. Our keynote speaker is Josephine Johnston, who will address one of the leading developments of the day, gene editing. A New Zealand trained attorney, Ms. Johnston has a master's degree in bioethics and health law from University of Otago in New Zealand. She practiced law in New Zealand and in Germany. She's an expert on the ethical, legal, and policy implications of biomedical technologies, particularly as use in reproduction, psychiatry, genetics, and neuroscience. In 2003, she joined the Hastings Center as a research scholar. Now, the Hastings Center is an independent bioethics research institute in Garrison, New York. She became director of research there in 2012. She's the author of numerous scholarly articles. Her commentaries also have appeared in the Washington Post, The New Republic, Time Magazine, and The Scientist. She's co-editor of a 2010 book entitled Trust and Integrity in Biomedical Research, The Case of Financial Conflicts of Interest. This was published by the Johns Hopkins University Press. She's also co-editor of an exciting new collection of essays entitled Human Flourishing in an Age of Gene Editing, published about a month ago by Oxford University Press. The book is directly on point with our topic, and it is hot off the presses. After the lecture, yes, there will be a book signing right outside that door. Her other current projects address the potential use of genetic sequencing technology in newborns and the ethical implications of new kinds of prenatal genetic tests. She's also a member of Columbia University Medical Center's Center for Excellence in Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications. They're looking at psychiatric, neurologic, and behavioral genetics. By the way, uh, Ms. Johnson will be going to the genetics classes tomorrow, yes, at 8.30 a.m. Did you know that? No, okay. Um, I could say more, but I just want to stress how privileged we are to welcome Josephine Johnston to the campus to share her knowledge and reflections on, 
on an important topic. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Brian, and um, thank you, everybody. As Brian mentioned, I'm from New Zealand, um, Aotearoa, and this is how I speak. Um, you're not going to um, get a different accent in the course of this talk, so I hope that you can understand everything I say. Um, and in that spirit, I wanted to say um, tēnā koutou katoa, which is hello um, in the language of the native persons of New Zealand, and I wanted in that spirit to acknowledge the native persons of this land and the enslaved people who built this beautiful institution. Um, okay. um, I w I'm excited for you that you've chosen this topic, the ethics of technology, for a theme for the year. I think it's really uh, fascinating. Of course, I'm a little biased because it's exactly where uh, a lot of my work sits. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about where I work because it's an unusual place and then I'll, I'll say more about the specific topic today. Okay, now make sure that I want to make sure I do this right. Sorry. There. Okay, so first I just wanted to show you where I'm from. This is um, the Otago Peninsula at the bottom east coast side of New Zealand. Um, and this is where I uh, live now and work now, which is the Hudson River Valley uh, north of New York City. So when I say I'm living in New York, a lot of people think Manhattan, uh, but actually if you travel just an hour north uh, up the river, you get to this very bucolic place, and I live in a small town not that different from this one here. Um, this is the view in the winter from the Hastings Centre, and uh, this is our home, our building that we're in. We're celebrating our 50th year, so we, we were founded in 1969 by a philosopher and a psychiatrist, who thought that there were a lot of ethical and policy issues being raised by advances in science and medicine. This was a time when um, uh, intu uh, intubation, people breathing, artificial ventilation was just um, new. There were lots of questions about um, interventions in psychiatry and genetics, and they wanted a place where people from different disciplines could come together to discuss these and try to make sense of them. They thought they wanted to do this outside of academia because they wanted to overcome disciplinary restrictions and so they created this independent organisation. Our research is focused in two broad areas, just and compassionate healthcare and the wise use of emerging technologies. We don't do the science, but we think about and write research and write on the ethical, legal and social implications of it in these two broad areas. So obviously the wise use of emerging technologies is very much where I situate myself and where I'm going to concentrate today. Here's just a couple of examples of projects that my colleagues work on, so where it's a wide variety of topics. Um, and the work I'm going to talk about today comes out of a project that we did just recently finished on gene editing and human flourishing, which was funded by the Templeton Foundation, which is a private funder, private foundation. That um, work led to this book, and I'm going to draw very heavily both on the book as, and on my own essay and um, chapter in this book. So, um, as many of you know, since, well, at least since the double helix structure of DNA was discovered over 50 years ago, we have been contemplating the possibility of making site specific changes in the genomes of cells and organisms. It has long been clear that human, in humans, traits are definitely influenced by genes, sometimes heavily, even if it has been difficult to understand exactly which genes and how. We eventually gained the ability to map the human genome, and we've learned a lot about how genetic differences influence disease risk, disability, and other traits and characteristics, whether height, eye color, and other things like that. Our ability to act on this information, however, has been pretty limited until now. We um, couldn't make, we couldn't, we could ID specific genes and show, identify specific places in the genome that had an effect. We could say what they did, but we could not silence or alter them. All that changed in 2012 when uh, these two scientists and their collaborators published separate, by the way, papers. Um, about a new gene editing tool called CRISPR-Cas9. I'll say a little bit in a second about how the um, tool works. 
It's adapted from the, the uh, immune system of bacteria, so it sort of came into uh, genetics in a somewhat obscure way in a field that really hadn't had much attention. And um, this woman, especially Jennifer Doudna, had worked in this area for a long time, sort of in almost obscurity, and then suddenly became one of the most famous uh, scientists alive. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Indispersed Palindromic Repeats, and Cas9 refers to um, an enzyme on the molecule. So this is a diagram. I did not draw this diagram. Um, and also, I'm not a, a scientist, so I'm not excellent at describing it. But for our purposes, here's what I think you need to know. The blue blob <laughs> is Cas9. It guides. Inside of it is a piece of guide RNA, the purple loop. That piece of guide RNA guides the molecule to a specific place on the genome. Then the Cas9 um, acts as a pair of like molecular scissors, is the phrase often used, to cut, to, to separate, it's got little arms around it, separate and cut the genome. Then the gene is either repaired and often silenced, or new DNA can be introduced. So in this diagram, there's a green piece of donor DNA that when the cell repairs the break, is inserted into the genome. This, it turns out that this system is able to make changes in the DNA of cells, as well as organisms, from everything from bacterial cells to zebrafish to mosquitoes, to human cells. So it's a remarkably versatile system. It's not the first thing we've ever had that allows us to make changes to DNA, but it is far and away the most effective and easy to use of any of the tools. For our purposes, it's important to know that this can at least theoretically be used in any kind of human cell, whether those cells are sperm and eggs, embryos, in fetuses in utero, babies, children, or adults. This is the area I'm most interested in, the, pos the use in humans. When CRISPR-Cas9 um, came out and when, when it became clear in the couple of years following its discovery the implications of how versatile it was and how, what it could be used to do, it was really heavily covered in the media. So I'm sure that, well, that most of you have heard of CRISPR, even if you don't know what it exactly is. Um, it was on the cover of all sorts of magazines and as you can see, the headlines were fairly dramatic. Um, no hunger, no pollution, no disease, which sounds good, and the end of life as we know it. So that was one on Wired. Its implications for use in humans, and particularly in reproductive contents, was lost on nobody. And these are two headlines, uh, covers from magazines from 2015 and 16, showing that people were already thinking, how might we use this in humans? Here is a paper that really starts to get at the direction I want to take my remarks in today, which is this question about whether or now that we can potentially make changes in future generations, we might have some kind of obligation to do so. I want to say a little bit about why I focus, why I want to focus on parenting. Um, I think it's an inherently important area, um, and I also think it's overlooked. So. This is not the first genetic technology that will have implications for families, um, but it is one of the first that could allow directed, it's the first that could allow directed changes to be made to sperm, eggs, embryos, or um, children. In the areas of research in which I work, so in my field, my colleagues and I spend a lot of time thinking about what it might mean for those future children to have been created with the aid of CRISPR. But I want to shift today and not focus so much on the eventual children in whom this might be used, but the parents or prospective parents who would so, will soon be asked to consider consenting to this use of this technology in their children. These parents and prospective parents are not usually understood to be the direct subjects of a technology like this. It's they are not the persons whose genes would be changed. But they will be asked to make decisions for others in the context of one of the most significant and intimate relationships that humans experience. 
The American parents who will be the first to be offered gene editing of their gametes, embryos, fetuses or children may be in this room today. They or you will be called upon to make decisions that I did not have to make when I was a prospective parent and that I have not had to make since my child was born. As a result, their experience of parenting may be different. While not the ones on whom, whom the genetic technology will be used, they're nonetheless impacted and they perhaps could even be changed by it. It is this ability for gene editing to impact parents and prospective parents that I will focus on today. In particular, I'm interested in how new kinds of genetic technologies like this interact with ideas about what good parenting requires. I will focus today on the new gene editing tools, of course, because they're the most dramatic, cutting-edge genetic technology. But versions of my analysis can be applied to parental choices about whether to use a wide variety of genomic technologies, including many that are available today and that the young people in this room will certainly be offered. From carrier screening to genetic testing of embryos to prenatal genetic testing to the sequencing of newborns and children. The other reason I want to look at parenting and its role in the gene editing debate is that I think it's a good proxy for some of the ethical or moral issues raised by uses of the same technology outside the reproductive context. When people say that using something like CRISPR in adults or in non-human animals, in insects or in plants is playing God or against nature, they're sometimes making an explicitly religious argument. But often they're expressing a discomfort with the degree of control that such a technology gives us over the lives of others and they just don't have other words to express it. It's not that humans are always uncomfortable controlling other creatures in the natural environment, we do that all the time. But we've also come to understand that it can come with downsides and can leave us feeling that we have become responsible for effects whose magnitude we never could have imagined. I'm interested in that kind of concern about control and I find the parenting context a fruitful place for exploring that larger question. Oops. Because I'm going to be a bit negative in this talk, <laughs> I need to begin my argument by noting that genomic technologies, including gene editing, can bring real benefits to future children. They could offer parents and clinicians new ways to improve children's health and well-being. The cause of some mysterious diseases or disorders might finally be understood. Some conditions might be cured or better treated. Parents may be better able to anticipate and address their children's educational and behavioral challenges. Although many scientists, researchers, and commentators remain cautious about the possible use of gene editing technology, in gametes, embryos, and fetuses. Early research in this area emphasizes the benefit of eliminating serious disease from families and perhaps from the human gene pool altogether. To probe this possible use, some research groups have been using gene editing technology, this CRISPR, in human embryos in the lab to repair genes associated with beta thalassemia, a heart disorder called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and Marfan syndrome, which are all lifelong and in some cases lethal conditions. While none of the embryos in those experiments were ever transferred to a woman's body for gestation and birth, a scientist named He Jiankui in China recently did just that. You may have heard of, oh, you may have heard of him. He used CRISPR gene editing technologies to make changes to the genes of single cell embryos right after fertilization with the aim of making them resistant to HIV infection. This top photo is a screenshot from um, he, when he, he, when he, Dr. He, uh, in a series of videos that he made um, in order to announce his discovery to the world. You can find them on YouTube. He was actually uh, scooped by a newspaper or a, a journal, MIT Technology Review, uh, two days before he was due to make the announcement. We've known for a long time, that people, well for a while, that people with a particular genetic mutation are highly resistant to HIV infection. It's on the CCR5 gene. In this Chinese experiment, Dr. He sought to give human embryos that same genetic difference so that the resultant babies would be unlikely to ever contract the virus. Here he is um, talking about his work at an international summit that happened two days after the story broke about his experiment. 
He called his study a kind of genetic surgery or genetic vaccine. Much to his surprise, when the study was announced in November last year, the work was actually roundly condemned as being both premature and irresponsible. Now there's a lot that we could say about this work, and I'll be really happy to talk about it in the Q&A. For now though, I just want to note that this experiment, for all its problems, was proof of principle that editing of human embryos can be done and babies can be born as a result. Whether the Chinese experiment or any other possible use of gene editing will be shown to be safe and effective remains to be seen, however. If safety can be addressed, and some scientists are confident that it can, gene editing technologies could one day be applied so that the future child is never at risk for genetic diseases, so that their risk is greatly reduced, or so that they would be expected to be slightly taller, of slightly higher intelligence, more athletic than they would have been had their genes not been edited. If genetic technologies in general, and gene editing technologies in particular, can really offer those benefits, it will be very tempting, I think, to welcome them as new ways to promote the welfare and social advantage of children, as providing exciting options for reducing suffering and advancing flourishing as wonderful new choices for parents and prospective parents committed to the welfare and future of their, of their children and future children. After all, what could be more constitutive of good parenting than promoting your child's health and chances of success, even if that child does not yet exist? I want to back up here for a second and explain why I think that at least some prospective parents, perhaps people in this room today, are likely to have this choice to use gene editing in their future children. Despite the experiment that occurred in China, these genetic editing technologies are actually not available to prospective parents here or anywhere else in the world. In fact, because altering the genes of an egg, sperm or embryo would result in a genetic change that is heritable, that is that a genetic change that is able to be passed down generation after generation, this kind of use of gene editing technologies is currently against the law in dozens of countries, including the UK, Canada, Brazil, Australia, many European nations, and it's against national guidelines and many others. Here in the US, lawmakers have adopted a rather unusual but not unprecedented way of dealing with this possibility. Rather than having a law directly prohibiting heritable gene editing, which is what a lot of countries have done, the US has, since 2015, passed something called a budget rider. This is a small section inside a gigantic budget bill. And in this case, it includes the following provision. If you can see that from there. Um, when I, this is a 101 word budget rider. And in its current iteration, it's in a, um, I think 150,000 word bill, piece of legislation. So um, it's not super easy to find. What this law does is it prohibits the FDA from considering any application to do a clinical study in which a human embryo has been intentionally created or modified to include a heritable genetic modification. And the reason that works as a ban on germline gene editing is that the FDA has asserted authority over any experiment in the United States in which genetically altered cells are used in a human being meaning that anyone who wants to do that kind of work has to go to the FDA for approval, and as a result of this budget rider, the FDA is prevented from cons even considering, even responding to that kind of application if it would involve making a heritable change to a human embryo. Today, no US researcher can transfer for gestation an embryo made using a gene-edited gamete or an embryo that itself has been altered using gene-editing technology. So that's the law as it stands and this budget rider has now been passed four times. My prediction, however, is that if techniques show significant promise, determined and well-resourced parents will work around these controls, just as they already do in order to access certain kinds of assisted reproductive services that are not available in their countries. They often come to the US because the US allows a lot of reproductive services that other countries don't. And if gene editing specifically is shown to be safe and effective, even if only for one or two serious diseases, then this kind of blanket prohibition and restriction will not stand. Jurisdictions, including the US, will face compelling requests from scientists and clinicians and families to revisit these laws so that families carrying genes for serious diseases 
can use the technology, even though, or maybe actually precisely because, the changes they make will be passed on to future generations. Then the decision about whether and in what ways to alter the genes of future children will very likely rest not with members of Congress, but with parents and prospective parents, which raises the question, how will they decide what to do? Of course, no two decisions will be the same, and it's likely that many and varied considerations and influences will shape the decisions of individual parents. I know that everybody is different. Yet if patterns of decision making about the use of other genetic technologies in similar contexts are any indication, among those considerations will be ideas about what a good parent would do. I say this because research on parental decision making with existing genetic technologies like prenatal testing and genome sequencing already show us that the idea of the good parent is at play in decisions about genomics. And that as parents currently understand this idea, being a good parent requires them to maximize their use of the technology for the good of their children or future children. In one such study, which I've shown up here for people who need the uh, citation, researchers at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto offered parents full genome sequencing of their children. The children had specific health problems and they'd been referred for genetic testing to the clinic and at that time they were offered the option of instead of having ordinary genetic testing to have the whole genome sequenced. If the parents agreed to this, they would receive not only results about the child's condition, about whatever it is that sent them to the clinic in the first place, but also results associated with other kinds of childhood disorders. And if the parents wanted, the parents could elect to also find out whether their child carried genes associated with conditions that would only occur decades from now in adulthood. This would include things like the BRCA1 and 2 genes, which are associated with high risk for ovarian and breast cancer in adulthood. Where the study got interesting, I think, is that even if parents didn't want to know that kind of information about themselves, because they were also sequenced in the study, most chose to learn it about their children. Researchers who interviewed the, ch the parents about their decisions reported that many parents expressed ambivalence about learning this kind of information about their child's risk for diseases that may not come for 50 years, because they realized that while this information might be theoretically able to help them prepare their child for the dealing with this condition later in life when the parents may be gone, it might be difficult for the parents to make sense of these genetic findings, and they realized that it could cause them significant worry and distress. So the parents knew that finding out this kind of thing about their children could have downsides for them. Yet they almost all agreed to receive these additional results because they felt they ought to, no matter how unpleasant. As the researchers put it, faced with this opportunity, this opportunity to receive the child's risk for adult genetic conditions, parents felt they had no choice. This version of the good parent, where parents ought to know all they can about their child or future child's genome, is in the interest of the genetic testing companies, of course, and indeed it is already their message. This is Anne Wojcicki, the CEO of 23andMe. In 2016, she told the, new, the Observer newspaper in the UK, I tested my son as, as, he was born, as soon as he was born, and I tested my daughter's amniotic fluid. Genetic testing is a responsibility if you are having children. A construction of good parenting as requiring maximal use of genomic technology is also consistent with the rhetoric of some very prominent scientists who see universal use of genome sequencing, at least, as a welcome fait accompli. You may know Francis Collins. He's an American geneticist who led the Human Genome Project and who's currently director of the National Institutes of Health. And in 2010, he wrote this. He's repeated it um, in slightly different form more recently. He said, I'm almost certain that whole genome sequencing will become part of newborn screening in the next few years. It's likely that within a few decades, people will look back on the current circumstances with a sense of disbelief that we screened for so few conditions. He surely doesn't plan to force sequencing on parents, but the benefits of it are so clear to him that he assumes that sequencing is something that all good parents would want. 
Now, we may or may not agree with Collins's prediction, but what I want us to notice here is that this idea that good parents choose to use genetic technologies to the maximum extent, that, if, that that idea, plus a technology that really could offer a child a medical benefit, if it works well, so that's a lot of ifs, that idea could rather quickly reach the point where utilising this technology is not simply a choice or an opportunity for parents and prospective parents, not merely something that good parents can do to benefit their children, but a new responsibility of parenting, something that parents ought to do. I'm not suggesting that it will be required by law, at least not initially, but it might be required by at least some prospective parents' culture or social group. It could become a norm of parenting. These parents and prospective parents might feel, as the Toronto parents did, that they have no real choice about whether to agree to using genomic technologies because using them will be synonymous with good parenting. I want to point out an important problem with thinking about these technologies in this way. While gene editing may well benefit future children, and let's just accept that notion for now, it might not be an out and out boom for parents and prospective parents. And I'm going to spend a little time now thinking through some of the burdens that a technology like this might place on parents. At least in its earliest iterations, it's likely to be physically burdensome to women in particular. Right now, if you it would require prospective parents to refrain from procreating the old fashioned way and to instead undergo in vitro fertilization, which involves medical testing, medically induced superovulation, and surgical egg extraction before embryos can be created in the lab, tested, edited, and then transferred to the woman's uterus for gestation. If pregnancy is not achieved or does not lead to a healthy birth, the process may need to be repeated. Significant physical discomfort and some health risks accompany IVF, we know this already, yet the need for this process is really discussed in coverage of germline gene editing. In China, the, all of those um, embryos were created using IVF, and all of the, couple, the eight couples that were in this experiment all had to undergo, the women all had to undergo IVF treatment as part of the study, but you never hear about that. Use of gene editing might also come with a time burden Sorry, but um, IVF takes many months. If you just compare this to how we many people procreate today, IVF takes months from initiation of testing through egg development and retrieval, embryo creation and testing, and embryo transfer. In addition, um, it can remain uncertain. Uh, sorry. In addition, uh, the genomics behind it will remain uncertain and complex for a long time to come. As one genome scientist recently remarked, it's misleading to equate advances in big data and genomic tools with similar strides in understanding how genetic differences impact health. So clinicians who are dealing with patients going through IVF before doing gene editing will need to take a lot of time to discuss sequencing results and gene editing options and the implications of various choices with prospective parents. Understanding this complexity in making gene editing choices will likely be cognitively burdensome for clinicians and prospective parents alike. To study your genome, geneticists compare it to what are called reference genomes or databases. In 2015, which in the context of genomics is a long time ago, um, the, the Thousand Genomes Project reported that a typical genome differs, differs from the reference human genome at 4.1 million to 5 million sites and contains an estimated 2,100 to 2,500 structural variants affecting about 20 million bases of sequence. This is just a really highly technical way of saying that while some disorders and diseases have clear genetic causes, many are far more complex than that and much is still unknown. Utilising the results of genome sequencing, deciding what to edit and what not to edit, which risks to take and which to seek to avoid, could also be emotionally burdensome. We already know from multiple studies of decision making around prenatal testing that the presence of genetic markers, especially those that would have an uncertain impact on the future child, can generate significant worry in prospective parents. Now, if gene editing could repair those genes, it might alleviate the worry, you would think. 
But the same research in the prenatal context indicates that worry can continue even after the all clear is given. We just continue to think that something might be wrong even if a healthy child is born and we continue to uh, watch that child more closely than if we had never had these genetic interventions in the first place. We also know from research on prenatal testing that prospective parents can be distressed by the information they learn about themselves and their partners in the process of testing their pregnancies. Sometimes they find out that they carry variants associated with autism or cancer or schizophrenia or early onset Alzheimer's, things that many adults actually choose not to find out about themselves. Gene editing would require sequencing, that's how it would begin. And it would turn up these same kinds of potentially unwanted or unexpected information. It would also be financially burdensome, yet be something that parents feel they ought to pay for. Costs would exceed the twelve dollars to $15,000 associated with a single cycle of IVF because you would have to do the IVF and then the editing on top of that. And like IVF, we, would, we should expect significant variation even within the US about when access to the technology will be covered by insurance and when it will fall to individuals to pay. Will paying for gene editing be an expected part of the cost of childbearing, much like the cost of childcare and college education? Will people go into debt to pay for it, as they already do, to cover IVF and other reproductive technologies. Finally, and I think this is where things get pretty interesting, some or all uses of gene editing technology in the reproductive context will, rec will require parents to consider acting against their values or deeply held beliefs. In a study by UK researcher Jackie Leach Scully that's actually um, discussed in our book, some parents have argued that it is wrong for a parent to seek significant control over their future child precisely because too much control risks compromising a fundamental feature of parenthood, one that parents benefit from as much as a future child. What she's saying, I think, is that uses like this in reproductive genetics can cause parents to have to act in ways that are di deeply distressing to them. And in this concern about reproductive genetics, I see a parent-focused argument that dovetails with the one I'm trying to make today. It points out that parents and prospective parents might themselves be harmed or compromised by the kinds of choices they have to make about their future children if they are using gene editing. One such values conflict could center on the nature of disability. A prospective parent who sees some, if not all, disabilities as thoroughly consistent with living a good life could view the choice to edit a gene associated with a particular disability as the, dis as the adoption of a discriminatory or misguided view. To this parent, choosing, for example, to eliminate a gene in their embryos for deafness or autism might on the one hand benefit the future child, but on the other directly conflict with that parent's understanding of those conditions as differences to be embraced, not disorders or faults to be repaired. And parents finding themselves in that kind of moral dilemma could, find, could feel deeply distressed. Reproductive use of gene editing could also conflict with a prospective parent's understanding of the nature of parenting. For such a parent, and I actually count myself amongst this group, the parenting role importantly involves having to balance acceptance with control. These kinds of parents might be reluctant to use gene editing technologies to its fullest extent because being a parent who knows that much about and exercises that much control over their parents' genes could conflict with the kind of person they want to be and the kind of parenting experience they are committed to having. They just might not see themselves as always needing to be the maker or the fixer of their children, although this is the exact role that the technology seems to put them in. These burdens on parents, which are seldom acknowledged, will not be experienced by all parents. There are people who don't care about any of this and for whom none of this is a problem. And they won't weigh equally on all who encounter them. But they will be very real for some people. They could fall disproportionately on women, especially the physical burden associated with uh, IVF and the embryo testing and editing. And they would also be especially difficult for the poor, 
the disabled, those with a history of genetic disease in their families, and those with particular religious, moral, or political commitments. The reality of these burdens means that while using gene editing and other kinds of genetic technologies might arguably benefit children and future children, doing so could also negatively impact the health and well-being of parents. Does that matter? Does the potential clash between the best interests of future children and the flourishing of prospective parents matter? In particular, does it matter for our understanding of good parenting? If we think that a good parent's sole obligation is to further the best interests of their children, then no, it doesn't matter. But if we think, as I want to persuade you, that parents' flourishing matters too, that good parents also need to take their own interests as persons into account in their decisions, then yes, the burdens on parents are relevant to our understanding of good parenting in an age of gene editing. The problem is, at least in the circles I move in, that this idea that parents' interests are part of the equation is not <coughs> widely accepted or even discussed. I'm certainly not the first person to ask whether prospective parents should seek to control the genetic makeup of their future children, but I am one of the first to suggest that parents' own interests belong in the equation of that dilemma. Arguments for and against parents and prospective parents seeking this kind of genetic control have actually been made by a huge variety of scholars in philosophy, religious studies, bioethics, and other disciplines and fields. And amongst those scholars, there's not agreement about whether or not or how much parents should use genetic technologies. But there's near total agreement that the best interests of the child alone are constitutive of the obligations of parents and prospective parents. Good parents act in the best interests of their child or their prospective child, and the disagreement is about whether using genetic technologies is the best way to do this. So here are a few examples. I think. This is Robert Green. Um, He's at Dartmouth, and he's argued that parents should strive to give our children lives unimpaired by serious genetic or congenital disorders, and we should take reasonable care to avoid doing so by inadvertence or neglect. So here he's coming out in favour of using genetic technologies to try to benefit children. While he doesn't believe that this obligation stretches beyond serious genetic disease, the philosopher Julian Savulescu, shown here, um, goes further, arguing that for a principle that he calls procreative beneficence, which he says requires parents to select the child of the possible children they could have who's expected to have the best life. So you make a lot of embryos, you have them tested, and you select the ones that are expected to have the best possible life, an obligation that he now extends to the use of gene editing technologies. Baked into these arguments of Savalescu and Green is the idea that parents' use of genetic technology should be guided by whether that use could significantly reduce the, the future child's suffering or promote the future child's flourishing. The flourishing of parents is not discussed. Similarly, and perhaps more surprisingly, scholars who've raised concerns about parents' use of genetic technology are also focused on the well-being of children. The German philosopher Jürgen Habermas, who's a real critic, I think, of, of genetic technology, fears that a child's freedom could be damaged by the use of genetic technologies, as could the nature of that child's relationship to their parent. In the US, political scientist Michael Sandel and ethicist Adrian Ash both urge parents to reject gen genetic technologies. Here they are, oops, there's Adrian, um, who said, said that the norms of good parenting include fostering and supporting the uniqueness of individual children with all their mix of talents, personalities, strengths, and problems. Here's Sandow saying a similar thing. To appreciate children as gifts is to accept them as they come, not as objects of our design or products of our will or instruments of our ambition. So these are two people who are skeptical, very deeply skeptical, if not opposed, to the kind of selection and control that genetic technologies promise parents. On their different but consonant views, good parenting, real parenting, is about acceptance and openness virtues that ensure the well-being of the individual child who will be born. Again, it's a focus on the child's best interests. Now, I don't dispute the importance of the best interests of children in our understandings of good parenting. 
I think it's probably an accurate focus. It reflects how parents actually make many key decisions. And it will often be an appropriate rule of thumb. It's reasonable to imagine that parents are acting in the best interest of their children. But notice in all of this that parental well-being is completely missing from these understandings of what it means to be a good parent. Indeed, on these constructions, it might be selfish and therefore completely inconsistent with good parenting to even consider, let alone on occasion privilege, the well-being or flourishing of parents. This characterization of the obligations of parents is just not realistic or fair. While I recognize that the flourishing of parents and the flourishing of children are frequently inseparable, asking parents to attend only to their child or children's interests to the exclusion of their own establishes a limitless responsibility that the vast majority of people will fail to discharge. Further, it is simply not fair to define the role of parent in such a way that individuals taking up that role must give up attending to their own interests and values or must always prioritise the interests of their child if there's a conflict between the two. Asking parents to adopt such a demanding understanding of good parenting is akin to saying to them, when you become a parent, you must cease to understand yourself as a person with interests and a life story. What might a more accommodating, reasonable understanding of good parenting mean for our use of genetic technologies like gene editing? One result would be that, we, that both the choice to use and the choice not to use gene editing technologies could be consistent with being a good parent, depending not only on what the technology could do for the future child, but on the burdens or demands it might place on the parents. This understanding might legitimise a parent's decision not only to find out and seek to control some aspects of their child's genome, but also to place certain limits around how far they are willing to go, to allow them to leave some things to chance. Practically, this approach means that prospective parents and parents need real choice about whether and how to use genetic technologies which means that routinization of genetic technologies in ways that obviate choice, as well as social pressure to use the technologies, will both need to be avoided. Because the idea that parenting is only about the child's best interests or the child's flourishing is deeply ingrained in Western culture, along with the idea that considering parental interests or well-being is selfish and inappropriate, an attempt to broaden the concept of the good parent in the way that I'm advocating will require some work. Some of that work can be undertaken by social institutions, including schools, colleges, and universities. The media and the arts can, and already do, play a significant role in testing our assumptions about the relationship between technology and human flourishing, and this is an issue that they also address. Individual prospective parents may also need help to reflect on their own values and interests, including what they care about and why, and to consider what a decision to edit or not to edit might mean for who they are as responsible actors with their own life stories. Clinicians, clergy, teachers, counselors, family and friends can encourage this kind of nuanced self-examination. Finally, we need, of course, supportive laws, policies and practices that make it possible for people to really choose how to use the technologies. If you live in a culture that punishes people for having brown skin or some kind of disability, then your choice about whether to use genetic technologies will be deeply shaped by the lack of supportive laws, policies and practices in your culture. Uh, this is the bit where I put up a picture of myself. <laughs> I hope I have persuaded you, or at least opened up the possibility in your minds, that good prospective parents have responsibilities to future children, but also to themselves. And that the burdens of technology that, like gene editing, could place on them, including pressures to askew their own values and act in ways that are inconsistent with their flourishing, that those pressures are relevant considerations in both individual decisions about whether and how to use the technology, as well as policies and norms shaping those choices. It's incumbent on us, I think, to recognise the burdens on parents associated with this kind of intervention, 
and to be open to supporting parents who act to protect their own flourishing. Only with this richer understanding of the nature and responsibilities of parenting can we adopt technologies like gene editing in ways that benefit parents, children, and generations to come. And with that, I would like to open the floor to your questions. Uh, this, this is me with my child who definitely has taught me some of these lessons the hard way. Hi. There's a micro, there are two microphones, so it's helpful to use them. Um, thanks so much. Um, so as I understand it, you're really thinking about the, the responsibilities of the parent to children and to themselves. I'm curious what you would say or what others in the field would say about the responsibility of a good parent to the community. Mm -hmm. That is, what, what is parental responsibility when it um, involves participating in, a, in something that will certainly perpetuate and expand inequality? Mm -hmm. So, um, in, ugh, let me, um, some of the people I, I previewed you know, very briefly, um, care a lot about um, that question, I think, in the way that you mean it. So by saying that what I mean is they care a lot about um, adopting technologies that perpetuate inequality or make inequality worse, and that could happen if a beneficial technology, so if gene editing turns out to be helpful for providing social advantage, um, that they would be concerned if that were only available to wealthy people. Okay. Um, but there's another version of your question, which is that there are also people who argue that it is an obligation of, few, of parents to think about the burdens that their child might place on society if they don't either genetic, do prenatal testing or embryo selection or you know one day gene editing. So. Um, so Julian Savalescu in particular frames his procreative beneficence as an obligation that a parent has, or a future parent has, to, um, well, that's the thing. He's never really entirely clear about who the obligation is owed to. The way it's framed implies that it's owed to the future child, um, but you can't help but feel in his discussion that he's also concerned about improving the overall sort of uh, genetic um, fitness of society or a country and that uh, that he feels that we have an obligation to each other to sort of have the best possible child by some set of um, sort of optimization standards that he has in mind so it's both and they're really different ways of thinking about what justice requires of us with really I think um, almost um, incompatible outcomes. Hello, can you expand a little bit on the idea of editing an adult's genes and how that would affect parents who are much older since this individual is already an adult? Yeah, so um, right now in discussion, well, for the longest time, including now, in discussion of this kind of making changes in people's genes, because there were other tools to do it, they just didn't really work that well before. Um, the discussion has distinguished between um, what are called somatic changes, so changes in cells that are not uh, passed on to future generations. So basically, if you make a change in the genome of an adult, like taking, like you take some blood out of their body, you change the genes in that blood, and then put it back in. Um, we don't think that it will end up in your eggs or sperm and it won't be passed on to any children you might go on to have. So if you had a problematic gene and uh, that was causing you to have a disease and you got treated with a gene editing th therapy, um, that would not prevent you from passing that gene on to your children. And so there's this distinction between what are called somatic changes and what are called germline changes. Um, there is a little gray area in there because there are some interventions that you could do in utero, for instance, that could look like somatic changes, but they could end up at least partially in the germline. So, um, and it hasn't, we haven't done it enough to be totally sure, but the theory is that these are they're separable. So um, there actually are already clinical trials of CRISPR and other um, 
gene editing technologies in adults with genetic diseases, um, just a few, and um, on cancer too, and uh, those are assumed to be somatic editing um, studies where there would be no way that, that changes could be passed on. Does that make sense? Thank you. Um, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I, was, I was wondering, and I'm really sympathetic to what you have to say, but I became a little bit puzzled about whether um, parental interests were completely separable from the child's interest. So your, yeah. your worries about parental interest um, make sense, and the separation between the parent, parent's interest and the child's interest makes sense if you're talking about specific individuals. So like, of course, you know, um, I can benefit from something individually that my son doesn't benefit from and vice versa. But when it comes to broad changes in the culture or broad policies, I'm wondering if we can maintain that separability of interest because of course the typical child grows up to be the typical parent. And so if we're yes. worried about, right, so if we're worried about, you know, um, burdening parents like a policy or a cultural change that burdens parents or changes things for parents that stresses them out or makes life worse, well, we would also be talking about burdening the children mm -hmm. in that way, given yeah. that they'll probably grow up to have children. Unless um, you think that you can make some of these changes in a single generation. So if your idea is like, well, we could do genetic changes on one generation, so that they then would have these extra good genomes that would be passed on, then they wouldn't need to do gene editing for their future children. I see. I mean, okay. But the so that's really just a almost weaselly um, technical answer to your question. <laughs> um, I think that the philosophical point that I I'm not sure if you were going to say were saying, but that I think about is that I've constructed this argument as if there is the separation between the interests of parents and children, and I understand and actually agree that like that separation is pretty artificial most okay. of the time. Um, it's just that it's very easy for that fact to mean that we never notice the ways in which these technologies impact women in, in particular um, and parents in general. So if you assume that the parents are, and their children's interests are intimately connected, and you then talk primarily about children's interests, right. Right. it's very easy to forget that all the people in He and Kui's study, the women all had to do IVF. No one talks about it. Or um, that uh, offering somebody a gene editing technology to get rid of deafness in their family could actually cause the parent to have to um, decide something that they find to be deeply offensive. Right. So and one of the reasons that I've and because I'm sort of, this procreative beneficence idea um, could make you, could be an argument for, for instance, only having boys. Because most cultures, it's better to be male, maybe not, yeah. I don't know. But in some cultures it is, right? So um, just straight up. So that you could say, well, that means that everybody, that if you lived in that culture and you really wanted to give your child the best possible life, you would make sure they were a male. Um, or, you know, if you have brown skin, you could make sure that they don't. And that would involve you having to do something that could feel like the exact opposite of everything you stand for. Yeah. So that's the tension that I'm interested in. And, some, and to discuss it, I almost have to artificially separate the interests of children and parents. I see, okay. Um, but it's not that I think they are completely yeah, separate. Because I was thinking of that as like a way, as like a like a way to kind of another way to convince people who are only talking about children that they should that no actually. that the children themselves will become parents yeah, one that, day too. That, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know what other people here think, but my um, feeling of, <laughs> my feeling about the um, American standard for being a good parent. Like there's sort of being an adequate parent, but then there's being like a really excellent parent, is that it's extremely expensive. So as coming from another country to the United States, um, and then having a child here, I was sort of shocked at like what I got heard were the sorts of financial resources that I'm supposed to uh, accumulate for her. 
um, for college and also apparently her wedding, which where I come from, you pay for yourself. Um, and I just couldn't imagine how I could possibly save $150,000 like in the course of her lifetime. And, um, and yet that seems to be fairly widely accepted, even though the majority of Americans can't do it. Um, so I was also a little bit spurred to start thinking about this tension because I just felt like when you go to another culture, you really notice the things that are sort of baked into that culture's assumptions. It's not like there aren't those assumptions in New Zealand about different things. I just didn't know what, you know, they're not as obvious to me. Um, so those also were kind of on my mind. Oh, and then there's someone at the back after the genuine and the purple. So one of the things that you talked about was, of course, expense. And another thing that you talked about was the uncertainty of, if we make a change here, what other effects could this potentially have? So if we refined the technology, say, 100 or 1,000 years down the line, to where we can be 100% certain that an edit here will have no secondary uh, impacts on the child, which could potentially mm -hmm. be negative, and we can also sure, ensure that it's so affordable that any parent, regardless of socioeconomic status, can afford to make these changes, would you then say that a parent would have an obligation to prevent something such as, say, autism in their child? So, um, I, let's see, so a lot of the burdens on my list could, you know, as you're saying, potentially be alleviated, including the IVF one, actually, because there's this idea that we could make sperm and egg from skin cells and then create like a hundred or a thousand embryos and test them all and then make the ones that are the best even better. Um, so, you know, it would be no big deal and it would be really cheap, apparently. Um, so all of that, if that thought experiment, it's a thought experiment because it's absolutely mm -hmm. not the case, um, still leaves for me this other question about um, those conditions about which I could be sure it would be better to not have and those ones where um, I think it's unclear. So, has, you know, we have a bit of a bad history for thinking that certain things are diseases, um, disabilities, or differences that um, are bad. Um, being homosexual was in the DSM psychiatric manual um, for a long time, and it was considered to just be understood that it was a disease and it was a bad thing, and I don't, think that people um, in the United States necessarily think that anymore. So I do have this, uh, and I think similarly something like deafness or um, we were just talking today about uh, Greta, um, I forget her last name, the Swedish, young Swedish activist with Asperger's who is, um, has said you know, that she thinks that her um, condition actually um, makes her a better activist. Um, so all I want is, is us to recognise that there will be things that we agree are really bad, like nobody's going to argue that tay sex is a great thing that any, you, know, you should have and you, you should just suck it up. But there are lots of dis disabilities in the middle where it's very difficult to say. And I think parents ultimately should make those choices for themselves, but I want us to alleviate those, to de-burden those decisions as much as possible so they can really do, make a choice that's consistent with their values. So you and I might disagree about maybe not really severe autism, I don't know, but maybe some conditions on the high functioning end of the spectrum, I'm not sure. Um, but I think that we should be encouraged to think hard about a decision like whether or not that would be the kind of thing we would want to edit out and I'm concerned about social pressure to make the choice in one direction or the other. Thank you. I think I can speak back to question. Yeah, and I can repeat the question. Is your, is your argument in framework about original ethics species centric? Oh. Is it only for Homo sapiens? And here's my kind of thoughts is should we be applying it to CRISPR technologies for animals that we control? Mm -hmm. And they're in sort of envisioning the parental aspects of those species. And then thinking about the future as Homo sapiens maybe start to break apart. Does it only stick with Homo sapiens and does it stick with the sort of byproducts of genetic controls that you could create additional, maybe a Homo crisperus or a, as we see other sort of species evolve? Yeah. In way into the future. So the question was whether or not my argument only applies to the current version of Homo sapien, or it applies to other animals or other future versions of us. 
Um, so I definitely um, do not think that I or many people are able to make a any kind of moral argument that transcends the development of the human self. I already know that the argument I'm making is not supported by transhumanists who haven't managed to change themselves into a different species but would like to be able to do so and they just don't agree with me that there might be some limits that people ought to be allowed. Well, I guess they might think it's fine if some people don't want to join into the transhumanist phase but they think it's misguided, right? It's the wrong decision. Um, but your question about other species um, made me go back to something I said at the beginning that I think the parenting context is um, an interesting playground for thinking about some of the same kinds of questions about control and acceptance and the role of humans in the world um, in other contexts, right? So, um, well, whether we would want to be similarly um, cautious about making changes to non-human animals, um, that seems to me like a good thing. Um, and that there might be values aside from safety and efficacy that would guide that work. Um, so I've done a little bit of thinking about the playing God argument because that comes up outside of re in reproductive context, but also just like, you know, with mosquitoes and, and things like that too. Um, and as I said in my remarks, it's often considered a quasi-religious concern and sort of dismissed as like nonsensical or not belonging in public debate or in policy. Um, but I, I think it often codes for something else. Um, we don't, just by the nature of our society, um, Western society in particular, we don't have a good language for moral concerns that doesn't often sound like it's come drawing on religion. And then um, what you end up with then is a, is a sort of public debate system that can only tolerate um, arguments about, uh, you know, sort of GDP and, um, population growth and things that can be measured. So that's the biopolitical critique, right, of the current uh, current way of thinking. And it means that if you say something like, I think this is playing God, that people just say, you don't know what you're talking about, and that's nothing to do here, where they might be saying something not about God specifically, but about their discomfort with being the ones in the world who are the controllers of it, right? That the role feels if not like some kind of um, sacred transgression, just like a role that um, they wish that w they don't want to have, right? So not everybody wants to be responsible for the lives of a whole variety of new, hum new organisms or altered organisms. Um, that's a huge responsibility and it's a particular way of seeing the world that is hard to um, swap out of, right? So there's a way of being in the world where the world is beautiful and amazing, or it is how it is, and you're in it, and you're accept and you're fairly accepting of it. And then there's a way of looking at it where you're like, I would change that, I would change that, I would change that, I would change that. And I think people know from their own lives that um, we go back and forth between those two ways of thinking. But there is something to be said for that first approach and switching out of that completely, even if it was. Um, that there could be something lost in that. So sometimes people, again, like using quasi-religious language, I guess, will talk about the value of seeing things with a kind of reverence, which is just a way of seeing that isn't seeing something as something to be improved. It's just a very different way of being. Um, my main concerns, though, with um, the prospect of making changes to non-human organisms is increasing suffering, animal suffering. So some of the changes that people are seeking to make or talking about making in agricultural animals are really just changes that would make it, it, it easier and for us to continue to farm them in greater numbers. Um, and so those changes often make me question the, the goal and the, the, the end goal of like, we would now go and make changes to cattle and chickens and um, other agricultural animals so that we can farm them more intensively in worse conditions, right? So making it that they don't need to um, move or stand up or that they don't experience pain. That just makes it possible for us to sort of farm them even more horrifically than we do right now. And for some people that's like just 
what you do when you improve agriculture, right? But for me, it raises this question about the, the whole enterprise in the first place, and then sort of who we become when we become the kinds of people who treat other animals that way. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned today and in some of your articles um, that an all-out ban on germline modification um, isn't exactly the solution, but can you elaborate more on the specific cases in which um, genetic editing is acceptable in your opinion? And then if it comes down to the type of disease, you're, the type of thing you're editing, like the severity of the disease, um, who determines what that line is? So does that come down to the government or does that come down to a private organization like the lab or an insurance company? Okay. So I, I um, you're right, I'm not, there are, in my world, there are people who are 100% opposed to germline gene editing in humans and others who think that it might be great and then some people in the middle and I'm definitely in the middle so I don't have a in principle objection to making heritable changes I just want us to be really cautious about it and I'm not sure how we're going to do the studies ethically to actually figure out if it's safe so there are these I think a pretty significant technical and research ethics hurdles to doing germline gene editing but I do think that there are um, genetic diseases that only really cause suffering, horrific suffering in some cases, and I can't see what's gained by failing to address them if this was the best way to do so. So um, I have hope that gene editing, especially in somatic, will be really helpful for people with any number of genetic diseases, including things like um, sickle cell anemia or um, I'm trying to remember the name of this cancer that comes in children. Um, anyway, so um, whether, you know, making a strong case for doing that kind of thing in the reproductive context instead of in a child once they're born, that, the whole case needs to be compelling, I think. Um, so I just uh, look for really robust justification and significant attention to safety questions. Um, now, who should decide? Um, not super keen on companies or insurers being the decision makers, even though I realise that is indeed what happens in the United States often in healthcare. Um, I do think that governments have a role to play in um, guiding the technology in it, and its use in their own countries and that there should be some sort of forum, which there is sort of, for international conversation. I don't think it needs to be harmonised across nations, um, but I do think that uh, it's legitimate for countries to have rules or laws that say that, um, that limit, among other things, the kinds of genetic changes that they would allow prospective parents to make in their children. Um, and I also think there is a zone in that for parents to be the ones to decide. Um, right now, parents, prospective parents have a lot of discretion about their use of genetic technologies in reproduction. Um, and I do think, just think that we need to get better at helping support that decision making so that it's not encumbered by problematic social norms or um, financial pressures that would be, or inequalities that ought to be alleviated. So I sort of feel like there'll be some things that will be off the table, some things that will be potentially approved, and then there'll be a quick, some zone where parents have to make their own decisions about what they will and won't do. That's my prediction. I will be here if anyone wants to talk to me afterwards. I'm glad you brought up Greta Thunberg earlier, the 16-year-old um, activist, climate activist, because I was wondering if these conversations about what it means to be a good parent um, intersect with conversations on climate change. So um, the way I see them intersecting, I guess it could have something to do with genetic technologies as well, right? Like maybe in the, at some point it will be incumbent on us to make sure that our offspring are ready for a planet with extreme 
yeah, I don't know what, but yeah, there, I mean, there is, there are all sorts of things being talked about, of course, and one of them is like making us more, uh, need less water or, um, you know, maybe better to be actually browner, not whiter, because it would be better for the, um, certainly where I come from, it's not good to be super white, that's for sure, um, with the ozone hole. So I think there's that kind of overlap, um, but the other overlap that I thought, you, what I first thought of when you asked the question was that, um, the climate crisis is actually causing a lot of people to ask whether or not it's okay to be a parent at all. Um, and if you do, then maybe just in having one child. So 20 years ago, I think it was, Bill McKibben, at least 20 years ago, Bill McKibben wrote a book in which he said that um, women should have one child and that it's incumbent on women who are educated and resourced to be the ones to lead that decision. Um, so he recognised that not everybody has the financial ability or the um, social uh, capital to choose to only have one child, but that those who can ought to make that choice. Um, and the climate crisis, I think, raises that same question about um, how many, you know, what ro the role even of entering to parenting, that the role that that plays in the climate. So I see it coming up there as well. Um, and actually... It raises the exact tension, which is that if you are concerned about what it might mean for your child to be born onto this planet, but you know how much you're going to love being a parent, you have that exact tension at work of their, their future interests and your own well-being. <laughs>